Thank you very much, Dilip, for the kind introduction. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, when Dilip asked me whether Nabaltech would be ready to contribute again to this ICMEA convent, uh, uh, event, I was thinking of what, what to present and um, to talk about functional minerals for thermally conductive polymers is basically up to the fact that it is very much in the media today. Everybody's talking about. And what I like to do is give a little bit a picture of what is really going on there in the market. Of course, showing some technical details on some development we are performing currently. And, and giving a little bit of a summary on, on how we see the world of these this topic today. Um, let me give the chance to say some words about Nabletech. Nabletech is a Germany-based company, uh, is a typical medium-sized chemical company. We are into the production of aluminum hydroxides and aluminous. So we are originally uh, based on the aluminum industry, and as, see, as you can see on the right hand on, on the right hand side of that slide. Uh, the history goes back to the 1930s when it was established as a production site of a big aluminum metal group. Nowadays, we have around about 460 employees. We have two production sites, one at the headquarter in Germany, in Bavaria, in Schwandorf, and a, another site called Nashtag in the United States, in Texas. Revenues were, have been around 160 million in last year. So when we talk about functional fillers, functional fillers is one of our product segments, and it's one of two, and it's the biggest product segments because it makes around about 110 millions of the total revenue of 160 millions. And these are the most, impo the most important applications listed here, construction industry, e and &E application, transportation. And the main focus or main uh, application need for function for the fillers we serve to the market is for flame retardancy. The applications are mentioned below and YN cable, of course, for ATH as a flame retardant is one of the most important uh, segments or application within these market segments. So what are the drivers of the fun functional fillers um, product segment? First of all, there's a growing demand for fire safety throughout the world. And maybe you have also heard of one important new regulation in the European Union, which is, which is the so-called CPR, the Construction Products Regulation, which is demanding for even more severe fire retardancy standards nowadays and requirements in construction applications, which is especially focusing, or which has especially um, um, relevance for us within the wire and cable sector, as well as in facade technologies, where our products are used as well as flame retards. And another focus of the regulations worldwide, and most specifically also with the CPR, is the demand for reduced smoke gas development. This is also very much relevant in the wire and cable industry and in other applications too. Secondly, green chemistry. Green chemistry is a very important topic for us and is an important driver for our market segment, uh, for, of, uh, for the product segment of functional fillers. Um, electronic products. ROHS was already mentioned, WEEE, the replacement of toxic systems with all natural flame retardants, and the reusability of products, the, um, the um, uh, recycling quorum, which is requested by the European Union, is now going to be increased, so it is a very important topic. And last but not, mali not, but not least, environment technology. So the development of renewable energies for photovoltaics, wind power, the cables involved there, and casings, etc. So the plastics used in there is of large, is a large market driver for our products. 
and of course the trend towards alternative energy storage, and I will talk a little bit about this topic as one of the drivers also for the topic of heat conductive polymers, is the topic of energy storage. And last but not least, electrical vehicles in this respect. And when we talk about the traditional um, way of transport, we talk about stricter exhaust standards for combustion engines. So for example, diesel particle filters for the old diesel technology is also a market driver for functional fillers. So let's start with the topic on the thermal conductive, heat conductive plastics. So when people think of it, uh, and what you see very often in media and in press releases and in a lot of publications, many people think of this, LED lamps. Basically, it's only a very minor part by volume of the requirement of heat conductive polymers and polymeric materials. It is more than that. It is all what you can see in electronics. So heat sinks to be used in electronic parts, laminates, substrates, boards, encapsulants. These are quite big applications, sealing compounds, and also housing. Here we are talking then as well of thermoplastic compounds. But other than that, the battery technology nowadays and electrical vehicles is a real driver of the market for heat conductive polymers. First of all, the motor needs materials which are also typical for all other electronics, like varnishes, housings, etc. Most specifically is the battery. Because here we are talking, we need gap fillers in modules and packs to get a good management, thermal management for the battery and the housing of the battery. So these are potential applications and upcoming applications for functional fillers, fillers to deliver heat conductivity. So let's have a closer look into the battery when we talk about a battery for a car. Simple, we talk about a battery cell, which is made of an active material, electrolyte, collectors, casing, and a cylindric uh, um, or prismatic shape, whatsoever form it is made of. And several of those cells are put together to build a module which has a casing made of metals or of plastics and which needs already a cooling systems. And last but not least, you put several of these modules together to form a battery pack, which besides the casings has also sensors, cabling systems, which are needed here. Let's start to look into the first part, the cell, the, the small cell. And I like to draw the attention to one important part of that, which is the separator. So if you look in the lithium ion battery, like it is made of today, you have an anode section, you have the, um, the electrolyte, and to separate between the anode area and the cathode, you need to have a separator. And these separators are made of polyolefinic materials, of porous polyolefinic materials, sometimes also made of some uh, uh, um, polyester materials. And the critical thing here is it has to contribute to, do, to the iron conductivity because the lithium ions, of course, need to pass this. But what you want to avoid is, of course, you want to avoid that anode and cathode get into contact. So normally the separator as such fulfills this perfectly. But if it comes to the case that you have an overheating or that the battery doesn't work at the right temperature, it may come that the battery is overheating. If the battery is overheating, you may, you may see shrinkage of that polyolefin, of olefinic separator like it is shown here. This is from a publication done by a Chinese colleague using one of our products. And you see here on bottom, 
if you use a mineral filler to be coated on, at least on one side of these separators, sometimes also on both sides of these polyphenic separators, you can avoid this shrinkage in case of overheating like it is, like it is done here in the laboratory going up to 170 degrees C Celsius. So how does it look like? So you see this is a separator, this is the polyurethane uh, um, separator, and this is the mineral which is coated on top of that. Normally the thickness of this is four micron to eight micron, maximum 10 micron. So very thin coating which, which serves that the separator will not shrink. This is the top view. You see the individual mineral particles. And still, uh, what is very important, this coating still, of course, needs to make sure that the lithium ions can penetrate through it so that you still have, of course, the, the full um, um, movability of the lithium ions. But what does the, the ceramic coating do? What does it do? What, what, what is it good for? It avoids the shrinkage of the polyphene separator in case of such an overheating, which may happen during unloading, which may happen if you have a, a, a overloading, so overcapacity. And it avoids also the forming of so-called lithium dendrites. Sometimes during the unloading process, lithium dendrites form from the cathode to the anode. And if this is the case, they can penetrate through the separator and you have a contact between the anode and cathode. And then you have a thermal catastrophic situation which is called the thermal runaway. And of course, with such a coating, you can avoid this. So it helps to further avoid such situation. And with all of that, you can avoid shortcuts. So this is a passive way of avoiding overheating. So the ceramic coating is not directly a thermal conductive material here. This is not the major sense. The major sense is simple avoiding the, um, the overheating by a catastrophic situation of short cutting. Secondly, when we then come to the module pack, to the modules and the packs, here we are talking about the cooling systems. And the cooling system is twofold. It is active. What you may need is a forced air cooling, and you have a passive cooling as well. Now we are talking about gap filler material. So what you, what you put into, when you put together the individual cells to a module, when you put together the module into a pack system, you need something in between to conduct the heat from the cells so that you can avoid the battery to overheat and to have the battery at the correct operation temperature because the operation temperature of a lithium ion battery is relatively restricted to zero to a certain narrow time, uh, temperature band. So what materials can be used as gap filler materials? You may have read in literature or if you're covering, if you are in, in this field, phase change material has very often been described. It is a nice, scientifically very nice, interesting material. The case is, if you talk about organic phase change materials, you have the chance of flammability. These are highly flammable, flammable materials. Very often, these are paraffin waxes type of material, so flammability is the case. When we talk about inorganic fillers, first of all, I have to say there's also inorganic phase change materials, but the disadvantage with these products is they change also their volume quite significantly during the phase change. And this is why they cannot be used for batteries because the battery pack has only a certain volume and the phase change should not be too big during unloading and deloading and during temperature changes. So what really comes into play are the inorganic fillers, functional fillers, which are non-flammable or when we talk about mineral flame retardants, may even provide flame retardancy. So this is showing why it is so important to have a good heat management of your battery, why you should avoid short cuttings, why you should avoid uh, as such catastrophic disasters. This, of course, was not really overheating what you see. This is a case where Tesla 
where the battery was, was uh, uh, perforated by, by a sharp object. That was just uh, an accident, so to say, and it caught fire. This was an accident where a, a, a transport aeroplane was having a load of lithium-ion battery and it, the, the battery somehow caught fire, uh, probably because of some overheating. What is shown here below are some slides from a company called um, Hazard Evaluation Labs. What they are doing, they make scientific investigations on such overheating effects in so-called bomb calorimeters. So what is shown right here is, is the effect of overcharging and the accompanying thermal runaway effect here in red. And this is what happens and what they can record and how such a battery pack or that, that is actually a module, looks like after such a disaster. So coming back to, uh, to more summary, what, what is important about heat conductivity? You know, heat conductivity, we have heat transfer, which is determined, first of all, by the thermal conductivity of the material, given in watt per meter and Kelvin. But secondly, of what is important, of course, is the exchange surface. The, the, the heat transfer area, so to say, where the heat can be transferred, and of course, the temperature difference between the two uh, sides where you want to, to, um, to distribute the thermal energy between, and of course, the thickness of the material. So uh, the, the difference of temperature divided by the thickness of material. And what is most important, it is not only the intrinsic heat conductivity of filler and matrix, but it's also the loading of the filler, which you can realize in the polar matrix, which is important to have a good uh, conductivity, good heat conductivity. But there are other factors which are very important. One of which is, of course, processability. There's a lot of nice products out in the mar market who have high heat conductivities, but which are extremely difficult to process. One, of, one factor is maybe some products show a very slippery effect, are very difficult to be dispersed. Others have high abrasion, high hardness. And then density weight is the next factor. Of course, a battery is, or a lot of electronic material is, is, is built into applications where weight is an important factor. So density weight is important. It shouldn't be too high. Heat Aging stability of the total system, of your composite, of your polymer material should be okay. And last but not least, flammability. Not in each and every application, but in many applica applications, flammability, or better say, non-flammability, is a very important criteria for the application. So, and what I've done here, I listed some of the most important product which come into play for this. When I'm talking about heat conductivity, I'm only and selectively talking about heat conductive fillers which are electrically isolating. I'm not talking about metal filled compounds. With such products, of course, you can achieve much, much higher heat conductivity, but also you are electrically conductive. So we at Nubletec are in these fields of fillers, so aluminum hydroxide, ATH, Magnesium hydroxide, MDH, boomite, aluminum oxide hydride, hydrate. These products have one disadvantage when it comes to the processing and compounding. If you have to go into engineering plastics, there's a borderline of processing temperature which is from 200 to 340 degrees C. So for ATH, many applications, like for example, many matrix polymers, like for example, polyamide are not doable. You simply cannot use it. The thermal conductivity is given in this column. Unfortunately, I did not find any literature value for ATH and magnesium hydroxide. It's difficult to find them. I found one, interestingly, for boomite. We, what we know by our investigations is that the heat conductivity of aluminum hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide is higher than that of boomite. But it's not as high as that of oxides like alumina, aluminum oxide, and magnesium oxides, where you have significantly higher heat conductivity values with a factor of 10 
compared to the corresponding hydroxides. On the other hand side, what you have to look into at, to, at is the density of these products. The metal hydrates tend by tendency have lower physical densities than the oxide materials. That is, of course, a drawback. Secondly, even a much more major drawback is the corrosion, corrosiveness, the hardness of these materials. Alumina has a very high Mohs hardness, so it's very abrasive. Same with, or with a, a little bit lower extent, magnesium oxide. Other very important or quite important fillers used in heat conductive applications are hexagonal, hex, hexagonal boron nitride, which has a very high heat conductivity. These two values given here is because this material is of a platy structure and gives in a composite material, in a compound, very different values of heat conductivity, depending whether you are talking in planar or perpendicular to the planarity of the filler material. Um, it can be this or this for the boron nitride itself. The composite, of course, is much lower than. Density is very nice of boron nitride, but boron nitride, and, and, a, and it's very soft material, but boron nitride has other disadvantages. It's very difficult to compound. It's very difficult to disperse into polymer matrices. Aluminum nitride also has high heat conductivity. Again, it has uh, two different values, uh, but it's very hard, and price-wise, it's much more expensive even. Boron nitride is already quite an expensive material, but aluminum nitride is only used in very seldom cases where it gives certain benefits. And the third product, the last product, silica, is also, I won't talk a lot about these products. I will concentrate uh, on, on the, the products on top. Um, aluminum hydroxide is, of course, very well known as a flamitant. It gives a very good flamitancy. We have already seen that flamitancy may play a role in most applications where thermal heat conductivity is required. And you can achieve high loadings. By multimodal particle size distribution concepts, you can achieve very high loadings. It is of very of relatively low hardness, low abrasion, a most hardness of only three. It can deliver moderate heat conductivity. It's not an excellent heat conductive material. It's not a very good one, but it gives some heat conductivity. The most the, the most important drawback is the limited temperature stability because it, it starts to decompose above 200 degrees C Celsius to form the corresponding alumina, aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide hydrate, aluminum monohydrate, also called boomite, is um, a product with a higher temperature stability. It only decomposes above 340 degrees C Celsius also because of its moderate hydrophilicity. Principally, high loadings are doable, are possible. But flamitancy, because of the lower content of hydrated water bounded in the chemical structure, the flamitant efficiency of this material is significantly lower than that of ATH. But still it can give, in a composite, a good to moderate flamitancy. It has a moderate hardness. It's harder than ATH, but still acceptable acceptable, and um, the heat conductivity is, uh, of these three hydrate products, probably the lowest, with 2.2 watt per meter in Kelvin. This is a literature value which I found. Magnesium hydroxide, again, gives very good flamitancy. It's very well known as an excellent flamitant. It has a good temperature stability up to 320 degrees C. So for many polymers, it's do, it's, it can be used, it can be processed. Hardness is comparable to, to, um, to ATH. Moderate loadings are possible, and moderate heat conductivity can be achieved in this product, so it's principally be, be, can be used. The issue with that material we have seen in many applications is it's high alkalinity. Because of high alkalinity, you have a limited polymer compatibility for in, in some polymers. For example, in epoxy resin, it sometimes gives some issues. And it has a low acid resistance. This may be of importance for some applications where 
the, uh, the, the electronic component where you put these fillers into are, are etched in a certain process, and these etching solutions are mostly acidic solutions. So let's have a look into reactive uh, or liquid resin where such fillers are used. What is plotted right here is the loading level or filling level in, in volume percent in a matrix, and the matrix here used was unsaturated polyester resin. And here we have plotted heat conductivity, which can be achieved in that cold cured material. What, how we measured it, it is the so-called hot disk method. You have two uh, identical samples uh, of material brought in between that measuring cell, the detector, and uh, by Observing the heat flow, you can calculate, you can plot the heat conductivity value. So now about the graph, what is showing here? It's different dots, it's a little bit complicated maybe. You have different grades of ATH. Let's, let's start with the sayings we have here. The heat conductivity of ATH is higher than, of, than that of boomite. Boomite is shown here in green dots. You see here we have different loadings of a boomite material, aluminum oxide hydrate material compared to ATH, which is the blue dots here. Second, the heat conductivity is independent of the heat conductive values, independent of the particle size distribution. PSD stands for particle size distribution. Can be seen here. Here we have basically two dots lying above each other. One is for an ATH grade of one micron size. The other one is for an ATH which has a broad particle size distribution with also coarse particles uh, between uh, 0.5 to 20 microns. You see, it makes no difference at this loading, we get the same heat conductivity. We have seen, we see difference between the material, boomite and ATH, but at the same loading, same material, no difference between particle size. So this is meant with this saying. And what, we can, we, what can we state from this graph? If you let, look at the loading in correspondence with the achieved heat conductivity, the most important effect, the filling level is the most decisive factor for the heat conductivity. So what is shown here on top, the best players here is two products with a relatively broad particle size distribution. It's a, a multimodal particle size distribution made of different ATH grades and it has particles in the range of one to 100 micrometers. You can see you can achieve heat conductivities in the range close to two watt per meter and Kelvin in this specific UP resin. Some optimizations are shown here in single dots. You can get a li little bit higher starting from purely ATH filled systems if you combine ATH with boomite, aluminum oxide hydrate, or with alumin, alumina boron nitride aluminum silica, silicate. This has been done here in some experimental, experimental status here, which is called uh, mix one, mix two, mix three. So very decisive is the filling level, but still you see with that relatively high loading of these volume percent, we are close to 90% in weight percent, we achieve only two watt per meter in Kelvin. Still, this is a, practically solu a practical solution. Why? When we talk about heat sink material, it is a matter of fact, or it has been observed, that when the heat conductivity of the heat sink material has achieved a value of 1.5 to two watt per, met per meter in Kelvin, the convective transport be in the be between the contact medium and the media which, uh, which has to, to get rid of the heat is the most decisive, is most decisive to cool down the system. So to remove the heat, you, you may apply a heat conductive material with even higher heat conductivity, heat conductivity. It will not help as long as you has, have not managed the cooling system. So what is most important, to have a good combination of an air forced air cooling system and a, a gap filler material with this heat conductivity is quite sufficient to fulfill the need. So two watt per meter Kelvin is sufficient for gap filler material. And 
we know that silicon-based, unsaturated polyester-based, polyurethane-based resins, highly filled with ATH, sometimes combined with some other fillers, are in the industrial approval steps at automotive OEMs. And these generations of gap filling materials in these battery modules are going to be started in 2019, 2020 with these new electron vehicle generations. So now when you need higher heat conductivity, we have already seen there's other materials like alumina. Alumina we produce in different hardnesses. You can calcine alumina to different degrees and then you get softer materials to harder materials. What is it about? It's a phase change. We have so-called um, material to start with, which is so-called gamma alumina, which is a relatively soft alumina. And when you calcine it to a higher degree, you have a higher content of alpha alumina phase. And the alpha alumina phase is the one with, which has the very high Mohs hardness. So this is explaining why we get from soft to hard material. Um, basically, if you look into aluminas, in both cases, softer and harder materials, the very good effect for plastic compounding is you have no temperature restriction on processing. You get good heat conductivity, but with the, I, I start with the, with the most important drawback. The harder you get with the alumina, you have very high hardness, very high abrasion. And that's, of course, problematic. If you think about your screws doing compounding, that's a very difficult uh, issue. With a softer material, this may be a little bit more moderate, but still it is a significant issue. A drawback of the softer material is that you have a relatively moderate loading, uh, which is possible because it has a more porosif, por porous structure, which doesn't allow for very high loadings. A drawback, which is besides the abrasion uh, with all aluminos, is of course you don't have a flame retardancy effect. Magnesium oxide is very similar. You have no temperature restriction, you can compound it, it has a good heat conductivity. You can achieve load, uh, medium to high to moderate loadings. But again, you have hardness issues. It's a little bit better in hardness, it's low in hardness. Um, and it's, it has no flame retardancy. What is quite typical for magnesium oxides, you very often find magnesium oxides which are very grayish, yellowish, or reddish in color, with, which are very often not accepted by compounders, by, by uh, polymer converters. So showing these pictures as a, as a, as a motivation, why, why is abrasion so problematic? What is shown here is internal mixer of a Brabender type compounding ATH in HDPE at this volume percent loading level, alumina, alpha alumina, and a spray dried granule of alpha alumina. You see here, if you want to polish your extruder, that's an excellent material to do that. Um, question is now, why is there more abrasion? Obviously, it's more clean than here and more uh, shining than here. Even so, it's con the spray dried granules contain some organic. This is, to our belief, and that's what we have quantified as well, is up to the particle size distribution because we have relatively big particles and what we have seen is the higher the particle size, the, the, the higher is the, the efficiency on polishing or the, the more is the abrasiveness of the material. And this is shown with the next slide. This graph shows you a dependence of different materials on particle size and the correlating abrasion of metal. How did we do this test? We used a rheometer, a rotation rheometer, and had a metallic uh, um, uh, uh, specimen which was brought in contact with a glycerin suspension of these fillers. And you set the, the, the whole thing at a, a set rotation speed and force and measuring time. And what you measure is basically the mass loss of that metal plate here over time. And then you get your abrasion. And you see with the aluminum oxide, with the alpha alumina, so the very hard alumina, you see the higher the particle size of, 
of the alumina, the more abrasion you get. The same is true with the softer gamma alumina, but the effect is less. So you have a lower abrasion here, and very little abrasion you see with ATH, or nearly any abrasion you see with ATH. Even there is a very little dependency on particle size on abrasion. So why not using such soft aluminars then, if, if the abrasion is so much better? Answer is given here. You see here um, the heat conductivity as a function of loading and volume percent for three different loadings we tried in an HTPE compound, volume percent loadings. And you see ATH with two different particle sizes. This is a fine precipitated grade with a medium particle size of 1.5. And this is a, a, a grade which has a medium particle size of around about 30 micron. And this is a bumite, aluminum oxide hydrate, gamma, and alpha alumina. You see alpha alumina, you can achieve relatively good heat conductivity values, up to three here, uh, around about, at the highest loading. The gamma, unfortunately, it is not possible to go up to these values because you cannot realize these loadings. It's, you can simply not get it into, the e, into this compound of HD, uh, into this H, HDPE during compounding. This is because of the porous structure of the product. So what, what could be a potential solution? This is what we are working on, what we have been working on. Um, you can take such a soft alumina, soft alumina in brackets, and try to make a core shell structure. You take these particles as they are, coarse gamma alumina, and you try with some coupling agents to get some finer products with softer material, like for example a boomoid material, aluminum oxide hydride material, on top of that and you get such type of materials. Other than that, you can also use a spray-dried granule of these gamma aluminas, so finer gamma aluminas spray-dried to such round structures, to such granulates, and then use these granulates and to, to do a core shell structure as well. This is shown below, this is the core, she this is the core shell, and this, if you go closer to the shell, you see different kind of particles. But still, you see, it's not the way that you only see one particle nature on top. It's, it's not perfect. You can't do it perfectly. This is just to show you the concepts we follow here to get, uh, get rid of that abrasion problem. This is showing some results, which is, which is showing that the, the, the issue is not that easy. Um, what is shown here is the, um, uh, we use a, a abrasion, we use a mixer, internal mixer, and then we measure the compound, the iron oxide, nickel, and chromium content which is inside. You see with ATH, we used a small, uh, med, uh, um, a fine precipitate ATH here. Basically no abrasion, the values here, the PPM values, this is already in the material. It is part of the product. With the alumina, the alpha alumina, you get some abrasion, you see some nickel, you see some chromium. And then we have here the green is a, 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 commer a commercially available spray dried granule of alpha alumina. So basically the same material here, but spray dried granules, you see that you can reduce a little bit the abrasion on, especially for the nickel and chromium values. Uh, what is shown here is the compound, compounding time after dispersion. So we compound relatively long, 20 minutes to do the mix, and then afterwards you can compound even longer, as you see here. And you see the longer you compound, the more abrasion you get. So now to the, to the ideas which we followed about the core shell particles. This is shown here, the core shell particles, spray dried blend of boomite and, 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 and and, and aluminum oxide. First of all, you see, yes, we see the effect is better than alumina, but it's not better than commercially available spray dried granules. And if we compare with a simple physical plant of aluminum oxide and boomite, it's a little bit frustrating as development is very often, right? 
you see the physical plant is even lower in abrasion in, in these abrasion values for, for the two um, iron oxide or chromium level. Um, so basically you can state the core shell didn't bring a solution. It's not better than having no, than simply blending the two types of materials. So why is this so? This is because when you disperse the material, then the particles, the, the, the core shell is not extremely stable. It breaks, uh, uh, breaks apart, and then you have the abrasion efficiency of the individual particles. And this simply ex explains why that core shell approach did not succeed the way we would have wished it would, it would give us a solution to avoid the abrasion. So other ways of giving a better uh, compatibility between the uh, filler and the polymer matrix and also maybe to avoid some abrasion is coatings. Here are different coating materials mentioned which you basically can use for the different polymers to be applied. You can apply in with different functionalities. I only show you, show you one example. We did experiments in polyamide 6 with 10 weight percent of glass fiber and used 50 weight, uh, weight, weight percent, in this case, weight percent of filler. And what is plotted here is the cone calorimeter, the heat, this is a flammability test, um, to also show you the effect on flammability. What you can see is, this is the no filler uh, um, product, so it simply contains 10% of glass fiber. It, sh it has this heat conductivity, in UL94 vertical flammability test, it fails because flame retardancy is not good enough and has the highest so-called peak heat release. So most heat is released during this test. When we, use, when we compare with the other materials using boomite, a coated boomite, we use a coated magnesium hydroxide and we use a blend of boron nitride and boomite we see we have an effect on flame retardancy. We see much lower um, peak heat, uh, heat release rate values. We see good LOIs, especially with the magnesium hydroxide and the boron nitride boomite mixtures. And especially with the boron nitride, we see very good or good heat conductivity values. So nice, nice result in first glance, at first glance. But if you look at the processing, Still, it is only a blend of boron nitride that we didn't use a lot of boron nitride. The dominating filler was the boomite. Still, you get enormous processing issues. And this is still a topic we are working hardly on to see how can you do blends of different fillers to get a better uh, uh, compounding behavior, to get a better injection molding behavior. Here you see injection molded specimens used for the cone calorimeter test, which is a 10 multiplied 10 centimeter plug. You see some bubbles here. Uh, so it was extremely difficult to process that. I would even call this as a, a plate out. This is more than a plate out. It's just, just a disaster. It was not easy to process. So there's still a long way to go for these type of applications, but I hope I could show you, and this is now my conclusion, that heat conductive polymer materials are gaining interest. That is for sure. But finally, after I would say five years of discussion, a lot of papers, a lot of development done in industry, we finally have really an application where we're gonna see real volume demand very, very soon. And this is with the electronic vehicles, with the battery applications, with this thermal management of batteries, which I have shown you. This, the good thing for us as a producer of mineral flame retardants, the volume demand needs here in this application they only need a moderate heat conductivity. And we believe that it will be mostly served with ATH grades, giving this, 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 um, this, this good viscosity behavior because of the multimodal structure, which allows for very high fillers and high loadings. Besides that, there is a demand for even higher heat conductivity in polymer matrices. And we are trying to develop such products as other suppliers, raw materials suppliers are doing too. And we work on such solutions. Um, the main focus, of course, is they have to be processable and they have to be affordable. Because what you see on the marketplace, many of those solutions are still very, very expensive. 
and they have to come down in price, otherwise they will not succeed. That was my talk. Thank you very much for your interest.